Hi, it's me, Franklin, and here I am on a farm. Last week we spent some time talking about file systems, and we got to learn a little bit about what file systems look like. So we took kind of a deep dive in terms of this tree structure, both in terms of the folder and file structure, that, that high-level abstraction that we're used to, but also looking in detail at things like inodes and super blocks and data bitmaps and inode bitmaps. That's great. File systems are really useful tools, and I, I think that we can all pretty much agree about that, that file systems are useful tools. But the problems that we have with file systems is that we're putting them in places that are prone to failure. We're putting file systems on places like hard drives that are in laptops that we can, for example, drop. We're putting them in places like hard drives that are in laptops, for example, where batteries will die. We're putting them on flash storage on phones where our batteries can die. We're putting them in desktop machines where the power can get yanked on us and suddenly our machine is off. The problem with file systems is that if we're making changes to the file system when that happens, the structures that we've built up in the file system could be in a bad state, kind of a catastrophic state. This week we're going to be looking at file system resiliency. We're going to be looking at tools that we can use to keep file systems in a state where the data structures that we're writing to the disk are consistent. RAID is a tool that can help with resiliency. RAID is something that can help with resiliency, but it does it at a significantly lower level than we're interested in. RAID is for persistence and resiliency across disks and improving performance across disks. We're going to be looking at crash consistency this week, and we're going to be looking at two specific approaches to doing crash consistency. Something called FSCK, file system checking, and journaling. Okay, so what's, what's the problem? We've got a file system, and file systems are made up of different data structures. Again, we've got the super block, we've got a bunch of data bitmaps, we've got inode blocks, we've got data blocks. Inconsistency in a file system is when we've got these multiple different data structures, bitmaps, inodes, and blocks, that don't agree with one another in terms of the state of the file system. Most of the time when we make changes to the file system, like creating a new file, we have to operate on multiple of these data structures. And if you remember back to thinking about threads and concurrency, we had issues with atomicity. We had these instructions, statements that compiled down to multiple instructions. When we're making changes to our file system, we also have this problem of atomicity. We've got changes that we need to make to the file system, to the data structures on the file system that are going to ha require changes to multiple different data structures for that change to make sense. Our goal is going to be either to take an inconsistent file system, one where we've got different data structures that don't agree with each other, and then force them to agree with each other, change them and make corrections to them so that they agree with each other, or we want to take this file system and make sure that it doesn't get into an inconsistent state in the first place. Let's take a quick look at some of the kinds of changes that we can make to a file system, how those changes are going to be accomplished by making changes to the data structures that we have in the file system and look at different crash scenarios that can leave our file system in an inconsistent state depending on when the crash actually happens. The example that we're looking at here is using a really, really, really tiny version of the file system that the authors were looking at before. So in this file system, we still have an inode and data bitmap, but we only have eight inodes and we only have eight blocks. Each of the inodes that we're going to be operating on have uh, also a simplified version of the metadata that's going to be a real inode. So we're only going to have a few different things and each of the inodes that we have can only have four direct block pointers. So we won't have that many block pointers. We wanna take the inode, the change that we wanna to make to this file, we're gonna take the inode that we've got here and we want to turn that inode into this. We want to extend this file that's represented by the first inode that we're looking at, and we want to add a new block to that. We want to make this file one block bigger. 
to modify that file system that we were just looking at to make the change to this inode to add a new block, we're gonna have to change the file system this way. We're gonna have to update the data bitmap. We're gonna have to update the inode itself. And we're gonna have to update one of the data blocks on the file system. To get from our first state, our primary state, into our second state in the file system, we need to make three changes. We have to update the data bitmap to indicate that this new block has been used by an inode. We have to update the inode itself, both to change the direct pointers that it has and the number of blocks that it's referring to or the size of the file. And we also need to actually write the data block itself. So we have to write that final data block to the file system. Again, making these changes is not atomic. We have to make three changes here to our file system in order for us to extend this file by one block. Because these three changes are not atomic, there's a bunch of different places where we can fail in between making those modifications to the file system. So one of those catastrophic situations where our battery dies or we like spill something on our laptop or I don't know, we get a seg fault and we get angry and we throw our machine on the floor. Here are a few different situations where we can write one block out of three. So we'll pick any of these three changes that we're going to make to the file system. And we'll take a look at how the, how the, the file system is inconsistent after we make those changes. The first situation is that we try to write just the data block first. So we write the data block to the file system first. If we write the data block to the file system and then we have a crash, our file system will go from looking like this to looking like this. That's actually okay. That's not an inconsistent file system. And the next option is that we write just the inode. So we update the inode and we replace the inode on the disk. So we go from inode v1 to inode v2. This is actually two different problems in one. inode v1 has one direct pointer and it has a smaller file size inode version 2 has two direct pointers and a bigger file size. If we've only made changes to the file node and not written the data block, so we haven't written the data block that corresponds to this file, then that direct pointer that we just added to this inode now points at garbage. It's going to point at whatever happened to be on the disk before we made this change. The other problem that we have is with the data bitmap. The inode that we've just updated says, I'm going to use data block number five. The data bitmap says that, I, that block number, data block number five is currently open for writing. So any inode changes that we want to make can use that. The last problem that we have, if we choose to just write one block before, one, make one change before we persist the file system or before we crash the file system, is that we write just the data bitmap. This is less bad than the last one where we wrote the updated inode but didn't make changes to the data bitmap or the data block. This is less bad because all that we've said now going from this to this is that we've said data block number five is used. That means that no other inodes will be allowed to use data block number five because something thinks that that data block is being used. The inode not being updated now and the data block being not being written is actually okay because we're not gonna be pointing at garbage. This is a space leak, kind of related to the idea of memory leaks. I've allocated memory and then never released it. Now we've allocated a data block on our drive and we've not released it, or we have it not being available for use by another inode. Those are problems with just one of three blocks being written. So in those circumstances, we're just picking one block, one of those changes that we want to make and then making that one change and then our file system crashes. There's also corresponding situations to where we've got two changes that are successfully made to the, to the disk, to the file system before our file system crashes. The first one is that the inode and the data bitmap are written, but not the data. This file system is consistent the data bitmap and the inodes all agree with one another. The data bitmap says that block five is used. The updated inode says that I point to block five. The inode itself is now pointing at garbage data, but the file system structures themselves are consistent. 
The other two out of three blocks, another two out of three block situation that we have is that the inode and the data are written, but the data bitmap is not updated. This is an inconsistent file system. The data bitmap and the inode do not agree with one another. The file that we've written that corresponds to that inode is now fine. If we as a user see this file system, it's gonna be okay until somebody else makes changes to this file system, maybe us, that tries to reuse block five in another inode. At that point, the inode that we have just updated, the data that it points at is going to belong to some other file and the file's gonna be corrupt. The final situation that we have for two out of three blocks being written is that the bitmap and the data are written, but the inode is not updated. Again, we've got an inconsistent file system. The data bitmap and the inodes don't agree. We've got a space leak similar to one of the situations that we saw earlier, but ultimately the file itself, when somebody's looking at this file again, they're just gonna see that those changes were not saved to the file system. So yeah, our, our file system can become inconsistent in you know fun and creative ways. This problem is really specifically coming from software crashing, our kernel, our operating system crashing, and, and that might be because of something like a power outage. The problem with all of this, again, similar to concurrency and threads, is that we're not doing this atomically. We're not making atomic changes to our file system. We're making changes across multiple places. The first solution that we have for this is the file system checker, FSCK. I say this as FISC usually. This is a tool that will be written for a specific file system that will attempt to find and repair inconsistencies after a crash has happened. All FISC tools, all file system check tools have to be written for the file system that they are operating on. So we're gonna have a file system checker for, for ext2, a file system checker for ext3, ext4. There's probably a file system checker for NTFS. There's a file system checker for FAT32 and exfat. The general approach to file system checkers is that they're going to methodically go through different parts of the file system and try to find inconsistencies between the data structures that have been written to the disk. But they all will generally follow the same kind of approach. So first, we're going to check the superblock. We're going to take a look at the superblock and make sure that all of the metadata about the file system actually makes sense. So for example, the size of the volume that the superblock refers to doesn't make sense if it says something like we're pointing at a 15 billion gigabyte disk. If there's a problem with our superblock, the only option that we have is to find a backup of that superblock and replace the bad superblock. If you think back to FAT32 and EXFAT, it has two of those uh, master boot records, the super block for FAT32. This is one of the reasons why we might want to have that. The next thing that it does is it checks the free blocks in the file system. It takes a look at that data bitmap. It goes through the data bitmap and then it goes through all of the inodes to make sure that all of the data blocks, the pointers, the direct pointers, the indirect pointers, and the doubly and trebly indirect pointers that the inodes are referring to are all actually reserved in the data block itself. When a file system checker is doing this, it's ultimately going to trust the inodes themselves over the data bitmap. And that kind of makes sense. That makes sense from the perspective of, we wanna make sure that if an inode actually refers to data, even if it's garbage data, the likelihood of it pointing to real data is high enough that we wanna make sure that our user will actually get their file back. The next step in this whole thing is to look at the inode states. So here's an inode from the ext2 file system in chapter 40. Similar to the superblock, the, the best that we can really do is sanity check in here. So make sure that we've got file sizes, for example, that aren't bigger than the size of the disk, or file sizes that aren't bigger than the size of the file system can, can actually be, or file sizes that are not bigger than the maximum file size for the file system that we're looking at with the settings that we've got. Next, it starts to go through and look at the inode links. Remember again that inodes that represent directories 
have pointers to data blocks and the data blocks that those inodes refer to are structures that are created by the file system. Directories live in the data section of the file system, but they are data that's created by the file system. So the file system checker can check the directory entries that are in the data blocks. Doing a file system check here is ultimately going to rebuild the entire tree structure of the file system and make sure that all of the inodes that are referred to by a directory and the corresponding file names that are in those directory entries actually point to other file nodes. Any entries in the directory structures that it finds that don't have inodes that are back at the beginning or alternatively any inodes that it finds that don't appear in this tree structure will be put into a special well-known location called lost and found. These are called orphaned inodes. The next thing that it does is it starts to try and look for duplicates. The way that it's looking for duplicates here is that we're looking at all of the inodes that are in the file system and trying to make sure that no two inodes refer to the same data block. Two inodes referring to the same data block is, is an inconsistent file system. Each data block should only have one inode pointing at it. So if multiple inodes point at that one data block, there's a problem. Bad blocks. We want to make sure that when we're checking the inodes that all of the block pointers that it have actually again point to, to blocks, data blocks that are actually in the file system. And finally directory checks. So going through and validating the data structures for the directory data structures. File system checking is kind of a lazy way to do crash consistency. We basically are waiting until after a crash has happened to try and react to the problems that might happen during a crash. This means that recovering after a crash is really expensive. A file system checker has to go through a lot of different stages and one of those stages is rebuilding the entire data structure, the entire tree structure for a file system. That means that starting our system up again We've crashed the computer. The computer has crashed. The power got pulled. The machine went down. Bringing the file system back up with the file system checker now is extremely expensive. This isn't really great if you're running something that needs to be up a lot, or if you're running something in a business where downtime costs a lot of money. File system checking here can take 30 minutes and well, time is money and you want that machine up now. The next solution then is to try and do this in a slightly less lazy way. We're going to look at solution number two here as journaling or something called write ahead logging. This approach is actually stealing an idea from databases. Databases, if you haven't taken Comp 3380 yet or haven't, aren't going to take Comp 3380 or whatever, databases use this concept called transactions. You start a transaction, you start making changes to the, to the state of the database, and then you commit the transaction. A transaction consists of multiple steps that are not atomic, but the guarantee that the database provides is that a transaction will be fully committed or it will not be committed. Transactions themselves are atomic operations. The idea of journaling is straightforward. Instead of modifying the file system in place, which is effectively what we've been doing, you know, making changes to the inodes, making changes to data bitmaps and so on and so forth. Instead of making changes to the file system in place, we write down what we want to do to the file system in a different place. And then later, when the file system, if the file system crashes, when the file system crashes, we play back the modifications in a way that makes sure that we can have a consistent file system at startup. This ultimately means that instead of making changes directly to the file system structures, we're going to guarantee that our file system can't be in an inconsistent state when it crashes. It doesn't really make a lot of sense. We're making changes to the file system by writing them down somewhere else and then just, you know, copying that data over later. Well, it does make sense. Let's take a closer look. First, we actually have to add a separate place to our file system called the journal. Just like before when we reserved space for the data bitmap, we reserved space for the superblock, we reserved space for 
data blocks themselves. Now we're going to reserve extra space for something called the journal. So what do we actually put in the journal? Well, we're, we're gonna do the same thing that we did before with file system checking and the crash scenarios that we looked at before. We're gonna make a change to one file by extending it. And so we're gonna have to write three different blocks. When we do that, instead of making those changes directly to the file system structures, we're gonna add an entry to our journal that looks like this. The transaction that we write is five separate blocks. The transaction begin block, the blocks that we want to change, so inode version two, the, the data bitmap version two, and the data block itself, and then the transaction end block. Both the transaction start and the transaction end have an identifier, an ID, a unique ID, so that we know that they correspond to one another. We make this transaction in the log, so we write this to the journal, and then what we do is we checkpoint the data. This is a fancy way of saying that we take what was written in the log and we start writing it back to the file system. So we take this journal that we've written, we find the start of transaction, the, the transaction begin block, and then after that we start making the changes to the file system that we have. But I mean, think about this for a second. We're, we're writing five blocks to the journal, and then we're writing three more blocks to the file system every time we do this operation. We've, we've effectively more than doubled the cost of making this one block extension to this file. On top of that, you know, it doesn't really feel like we've dealt with the situation of, well, what happens if we crash while writing to the log? Now we've just moved the problem somewhere else. Our system can still go down. Adding this journal doesn't really prevent me as a physical user from yanking the plug out of the wall. What happens if we crash while writing to the log? And, and importantly, what happens if we crash while checkpointing the log? What happens if while we're going through this process of taking what's in the log and applying those changes to the file system, what happens if we crash then? It doesn't really feel like we've solved that problem. Let's deal with this one thing at a time. So first, what happens if we crash while writing to the log? This is where those transaction blocks come in. When we write out a transaction, we're going to make sure that we, the operating system, uh, a file system, will only write the transaction end block once we as an operating system have confirmed with the hardware, with the disk, that the rest of the transaction has been written. If we are writing down this block here, this journal change right here, we're going to go through the process of making sure that the transaction start has been written, the new inode has been written, the new bitmap has been written, and the new data block has been written before we apply the transaction end block to that. Really importantly, remember that the transaction start and end blocks, the things that we're writing into this journal here, they are atomic. The transaction end block and the transaction start block, they are exactly one sector in size explicitly for the purpose of making sure that we can have an atomic write. So now the journal for writing to our file system looks like this. We write the contents of the transaction, so the transaction start, the inode, the, the bitmap, the data block, and then we wait for all of those to complete. Once they have completed, then we commit that transaction, we commit to the journal. And this terminology is exactly the same as what databases use. You begin a transaction and you commit a transaction. The journal here, we begin a transaction and we commit a transaction by writing the end block. We commit that last tra transaction end block. Only once that transaction has been completed, so once we've confirmed with the disk that this atomic sector has been written to the disk, then we start going through the process of checkpointing. Okay, so that's, that's actually kind of cool. That basically means that if we crash during a transaction, it's not gonna be a big deal because we will be able to see that the transaction end block was never written. So if the inode fails to write or the data bitmap fails to write or the data block itself fails to write, we don't care because when we try to recover from that crash, when we bring the system back up, we're gonna look at all of these transactions that appear in our journal and see that this one is incomplete and we will discard it. Remember, the whole point of this is not to prevent error or data loss. It's not to prevent data loss. 
The whole idea of this is to make sure that your file system remains in a consistent state. It's always in a consistent state. So let's, yeah, let's think about this. Here's the protocol that we have. We've got journal write. We write those first little bits to the journal. We've got the, tr the journal commit. We write the transaction end block, and then we checkpoint the data. If we crash at any point while writing to the journal, so while we're doing the journal write, the begin block and then any of the following, um, any of the following things that we want to write to that, the updated inode, the updated data bitmap, or the data block itself, the transaction marker is the transaction end marker is never written. And that means that if we just we just discard that transaction, we find the last thing that was written for that transaction, or we find the next start of transaction marker and we just erase everything before that. The file system is still consistent though. And that again is the most important part of this, is that the file system is the most it, the file system is consistent after that. If we crash after writing the commit, so we can't, after we commit the transaction, and remember, we cannot crash in the middle of committing this transaction because that transaction end block is a sector and it is, it is an atomic write on a disk, then that's totally fine. It's completely fine because we have a complete transaction. We have a complete transaction that says, these are all the changes that I want to make to a file system. Stop, end of it. When we apply, when we start up our system again after crashing, we're going to apply all of those changes and our file system will be in a complete consistent state. If we crash while checkpointing, so while we're reading this journal entry, if we crash while checkpointing, that's actually okay. The file system itself may be inconsistent when we crash, but the complete journal entry for the changes that we wanted to make is still in the journal. We don't remove that journal entry until after we have finished writing all of the changes to the file system. If we crash, let's say in this uh, transaction, we crash after writing the inode, but before writing the bitmap, or we crash after writing the bitmap, but before writing the data block. It's not really a problem if we crash during those because we have that whole entry in the journal. When the system starts up again, we're gonna start replaying this journal entry from the transaction begin. Yes, we're going to overwrite the inode, but we're gonna overwrite the inode with the same stuff that we just wrote it with. Yeah, we're gonna overwrite the data bitmap, but we're gonna overwrite it with exactly the same stuff that we just finished writing it with. Yes, we're going to rewrite the data block maybe, but we're gonna overwrite it with exactly the same data that we had just tried to write to the disk before crashing. It doesn't matter then. We're just redoing work. Yeah, we're redoing work, but in the sense that we're trying to make sure that our file system is consistent, our file system will be consistent after that journal entry is replayed. So that's okay. Okay, so that's actually pretty cool. That's, that's really neat. That's amazing. This exercise of writing down what we want to do somewhere else and then playing that back afterwards after a crash makes it so that even if even if we crash in the middle of doing that work we're ultimately going to be able to recover from that fairly quickly because we're just looking at this single transaction and we'll be able to get our disk back into a consistent state this, uh, I mean, this ultimately though, it sounds pretty expensive. We're writing five blocks plus three blocks for every change that we want to make to the file system. You're right, yes, you're right, absolutely you're right. That is pretty expensive, but we can do something similar to what the disks and I.O. scheduling are otherwise doing. If you think back to the, I, the, the chapter that we were looking at with I.O. and disks, one of the things that our drives can do is batch writes. So they can keep track of a bunch of different writes and then they can do write coalescing. So that was that special thing that was taking a bunch of modifications possibly to the same data structure and just keeping them in memory for a while and then eventually writing them to the disk. So only making changes in memory and then eventually writing to disk. Journaling systems can do something similar to that. They have the complete history of all the changes that they're going to make with these transactions so they can start batching these transactions together, identifying ones that have the same block being written over and over and over again, and then just put that into one transaction as opposed to doing it in many different transactions. Okay, so this is really cool. 
One of the problems that we still have with this approach though is that our idea of this log is that it's infinite right now. Yeah, we did put it in the, in the file system somewhere and we kind of set aside this uh, number of blocks for doing this journal, but it really does feel like it's infinite, when, especially when we take a look at the transactions that we've seen already. So let's do two things. We're going to treat this as a circular data structure. So think all the way back to Comp 2140 now. You've got lists and you can have circular lists. And also, effectively, we're going to be treating this as a file system within a file system. So here's an idea. Here's what the journal section is going to look like. So we're blowing up this full, this full structure. This is the big area that we've reserved next to the super block. We're gonna have a super block for the journal, a journal super block. The journal super block is going to have information about the journal itself. So this is distinct from the super block from the file system. It's going to have which journal entry needs to be written next and what's the last journal entry in this journal that we've got right now. The approach that we're going to take here is that we're going to add something to our protocol for dealing with this journal. So we're still going to do journal write, we're still going to do journal commit, we're still going to do checkpointing, but now one of the things that we're going to do eventually is free those transactions in the journal by basically just updating the pointers in that super block. So that's a lot. That's, that's a lot, yeah. We've really improved recovery time. Remember, the file system check approach, the system goes down, we have no way to recover, but we can check the consistency of the file system and then try to make repairs. That's real slow on startup. We've improved this recovery startup time because when we're going to have this crash situation, on startup, we just have to replay the journal. We can then assume that the rest of the file system is in a consistent state. The biggest cost here, and this really depends on the workload that you're dealing with, is that we're putting writes of data blocks into the journal. So every, every change that we want to make to the file system are going to have to have five blocks. The transaction start, the new inode, the data bitmap, and then the actual block itself that we want to write. Possibly many blocks, in fact. If we if we know enough about writes to this file system and modifications to this file system, we don't have to just put one data block in this journal entry. We can put all of the data blocks that we're going to, to write to this file system into the journal entry. So the biggest cost here in terms of what we're doing with journaling is that we're duplicating the data writes itself. So these are for the actual files that we want to put into the file system. The examples that we've been doing up until now are they're contrived. They're super contrived in that we're extending a file by one block. But let's think of a different workload. Let's say that you are being a good internet citizen and you're backing up a file of, that represents mm, a popular TV show. Let's say that's what you're doing. So you've got many millions or many billions of blocks that you eventually write to the file system. If we do that, that means that we have to write that change, that very big change, twice. 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 We have to write that very big change twice. We have to write it once to the journal, and then we have to copy all those changes to the file system, to the disk itself. Here's one change that we can make. Instead of writing the data structures and the data to the journal, Let's just write the data structure changes to the journal. Instead of writing the actual data that we want to put in files to the journal, let's just write that actual data that we want to put in files directly to the disk. This is metadata journaling. Now think about this for a second. Our whole goal here is not about preservation of data. The entire purpose of file system checking and the entire purpose of journaling is not to preserve the data that you're writing but rather the goal is to make sure that the file system is consistent. File system consistency, again, is about the data structures that we have for this file system. If 
we take the data and we write it directly to the file system. Our journal now is way, way smaller. This is an example of what that journal might look like. And it doesn't matter how big the data is that we're eventually writing to it. It doesn't matter how many data blocks we're ultimately writing. The journal entry here is quite small because it only consists of the file system metadata, the data structures for the file system. So all we've got now is an inode and the data bitmap itself that we want to write. If we're gonna do that, we have to change our protocol a little bit. The first thing we're going to do now is write data directly to the disk. We don't write it to the journal at, at all. We write it directly to the location where it's going to be on the disk. Then we start writing to the, the journal, but we only write the metadata changes that we want to make. Once we've confirmed that those changes have been written to the journal, then we commit the transaction. We commit that journal. Then we checkpoint the metadata only. Now we take the entries that are in the journal, just the metadata entries, and we write those to their appropriate locations. So I'm updating the inode and updating the data bitmap and then free. So clean up the journal eventually once we're finished. Yeah, that's great. That actually makes things go a lot faster and it reduces the cost of writing very big files to the disk. There's one tricky case where this is not exactly perfect though. It's possible to silently corrupt some data on the file system when something like with using this approach of metadata journaling. Really importantly, it's possible to make some data corruption when you're writing directories, when you're creating directories. Remember, directories themselves are metadata, but the directories are stored physically as data on the disk. We reserve a block for a directory entry that has a bunch of information in it about inodes, the inodes that this directory contains. But this is a data structure that the file system uses and the file system writes. That means that we have to be able to write the changes to directories in the journal itself. It's possible to have a sequence of circumstances where you make and then delete a directory so you add a journal entry that says to update inodes and create a directory entry in the data part of the file system in a data block. If you delete the, the folder and then very quickly recreate a file, when you delete the directory, you're going to be marking the data block that that directory used as free. It's eligible for reuse by some other file on the file system. If you then start to create a file using metadata journaling, you're going to start writing the data for that file to that location on disk. If we crash after we've written to the journal, we're going to start replaying the journal that has the directory entry metadata and it will overwrite the data for that file. So yeah, it kind of turns out that file systems are, are tricky and they're, they're really kind of scary. Okay. So let's wrap this up. Let's wrap up journaling with a timeline here. File systems themselves have a lot of moving parts. The journaling part of file systems also has a lot of moving parts in and of itself. Here's figure 42.1. This is a timeline of data journaling. This was the first approach to journaling that we looked at. The way that this works is that time kind of flows downwards. At the top of the diagram is the earliest part and at the end of at the bottom of the diagram is the latest part. This is, diagram is also showing us different parts of the file system that are being modified and kind of when they're being modified. When we think about this in terms of the protocol that we have, the very first thing that we do is to begin a transaction with data journaling. This means that all three of these rights are going to be issued to the journal. So the transaction begin, the metadata and the data that we actually want to write ultimately to the file system. At some point, these writes will finish. They will complete. Our diagram here shows that they are in sequence, but this, this could be shuffled around. The dotted line here says, we will check with the, the, this, the disk to make sure that those writes were completed before we issue the transaction end, before we commit the transaction. We will issue it and then we will complete that. We must wait for that to happen. So we have another dotted line here. Once we've committed the transaction, then we can checkpoint the transaction. We'll play it back over the file system. So here we issue writes for metadata and data 
and then they finish in some order. So here you can see that they're, they're um, completed in a different order. The other approach that we have, metadata journaling, and this is figure 42.2 now, is similar to what, that's, what that timeline looked like. Here, we're still issuing rights for the transaction start, the journal contents, and the, specifically the metadata, and the file system data itself. These are going to be issued at approximately the same time, and here you can see that they're in a different order. Here again, we've got this dotted line that says, the file system is going to wait for all of those to complete before it issues the transaction end block, before it issues the commit. We will also wait for that to complete before we start taking that metadata that we put into the journal and writing it back to the file system. So we've got another dotted line, and then we issue the write to the metadata in the actual file system proper. All right, so as if um, fisking and journaling aren't enough, there are even more approaches to making sure that our file system remains consistent. One is something called soft updates. Basically, the idea here is that we know a lot about our file system and we can take advantage of the fact that we know a lot about our system to make sure that we issue rights in a specific order to make sure that the file system itself will always remain consistent. The authors here give an example of where a soft update will reorder all of the changes that it needs to make to the file system such that it's not ever going to be in an inconsistent state. The example that they give here is writing data before you update the inode, but they don't really elaborate on that and it kind of just looks the same as uh, metadata journaling. Another is called copy on write or cow. Oh right, there's no cow there anymore. Instead of modifying the data structures in the file system itself, in the metadata, we will copy the existing structure. So let's say we want to update an inode. Instead of modifying the inode in place, we make a copy of the inode, we make changes to the copy of the inode, and only once we've confirmed that the changes to that copy have been made, we update the links in other structures to point to the newly updated copy of the inode. This is actually sort of what other uh, user level programs do. So Vim is a good example of this. Vim uses something called a swap file. If you do ls-la in your folder structure while you're editing a file with Vim, one thing that you sometimes notice is this hidden .swp file. The way that Vim works is that it makes a copy of the file that you're editing, you make changes to that copy, and then when you save it, what you're doing is renaming that copy to be the original file name. That's kind of neat. Another is the authors patting themselves on the back here and saying, hey, look, we did this and good for them. They, they deserve some recognition for it. They have created this idea called backpointer based consistency. And it's kind of like a doubly linked list, except instead of being used for traversal of a list, you have inodes that point to data blocks. That part's still the same, but the data blocks are now also going to have metadata within themselves to point back at the inode that points to them. The way that this helps maintain consistency with this structure is that we can verify that this double linkage is correct. So if we have an inode that points at a block and the block that it points to points back at the inode, we know that that's in a consistent state. So in summary, file system checking is, is fine. Writes are still super fast. We don't have to care about journaling at all, but recovery is now very slow because we have to go through this process of rebuilding the whole file system. Journaling is also fine. Writes are slow. They're only slower if you're using metadata journaling as opposed to complete journaling. But recovery now is super fast because we're only having to replay the journal. We guarantee that our file system will be in a consistent state otherwise. The main goal of all of this, again, the main goal of all of this is that we're trying to maintain consistency in the file system. We actually don't care at all about data. We don't care about user data. And that's kind of a problem, but that's kind of a problem for another day and another file system.